That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about One Fine Morning, or Ubo Metan, the eighth film directed by Mia Hansen Love, which premiered uh, at the director's fortnight sidebar at the 2022 Cannes Film Festival. Sony Pictures Classics is releasing it January 27th, 2023. I'm familiar with Mia's film, Things to Come. Yes, I, Isabelle Huppert. Have I seen any of their other films? Uh, no. Uh, What's their most popular film? Probably Things to Come, but Bergman Island, which uh, came out the year before this, uh, and was in the Cannes competition with Vicky Creeps, is also very popular. The Father of My Children, her second film, is very uh, well regarded. I also quite like Goodbye First Love. Um, uh, I want to call this movie One Fine Day. <laughs> but it's one fine morning. One fine You've seen it twice. Yes, it was one of my. It was on my top ten uh, releases of twenty twenty two. I do think it's quite good. Um, the basic story is, Lea Sedu, modern time. She mm -hmm. lives in France, mm -hmm. Paris to be precise, and she's just a single lady. She has a kid who's like ten. We see her dealing with her father, who has a neurodegenerative disorder. That basically looks like Alzheimer's, but like early onset. So her dad has had to quit his career as a philosophy professor. So he's living off of his pension, which is not enough to manage his home. So they have to make the decision to move him out of his home into a nursing home. So I wouldn't call it a procedural about that, but a big part of the plot is them having to transfer him from one place to another to find what's right for him. In addition to that, Leia's character is seeing Sandra, Mel, I think Sandra is her name. Her name, Melville Poupeau, mm -hmm. who is a married man with a child. So he's having an affair with Leia. But even that's very like basic. It's, she knows, but she wants to see if it can work. He says he'll be with her. Then he says he can't. Then he comes back. They take a trip to Italy, come back. And it seems like they're going to try to make that work. And we see that the father is sort of settled into to wherever he's living, the end. So I thought this was a very mundane story, but very well done, very well acted. It reminded me of like when you work with someone for years and you kind of get to know their life in pieces. And when you put it all together, it's like, oh, yeah, that's that's what's going on yeah. but nothing's exciting about it it's like a soap opera without the melodrama right but i think that is also something that's very difficult to do to make a film that's about life that's also full of emotion and characterization you know like it, i feel like we know these people i feel like listening you know it's clear that mia hansen loves very well read and i felt that this is very similar to things to come uh but i want to talk to these people about klaus mann and hannah arendt who Handsome Love seems to like because she's referenced directly. In I agree that these people do feel like these characters feel well attenuated. Like mm -hmm. I felt like I understood who they were. I don't want to talk to them. They don't seem that interesting, but it's very well done. Yes. And it, it again, I think the French have a fine tradition of this kind of cinema, but Mia Hansen Love is so good. Uh, it, it, it reminds me of uh, Ozu's filmography, Japanese, who's a masterful Japanese uh, filmmaker, but, you know, like, with a lot of titles that are, like, seasonal-related and maybe even kind of blend together if you watch too many of them in a row. But, but and his, who, Ozu's probably most notable film is Tokyo Story, which I don't think I've made you watch. But um, Hanson Love is collapsing... Um, Kind of what Rebecca Zlotowski is doing in her recent Other People's Children with Francois Ozon's Everything Will Be F Everything Went Fine, um, dealing with again uh, a, a relationship with somebody that has kids already and having to deal with your aging parents. Which uh, and there are plenty of other references just within French cinema that are dealing with both those, both those things. But I don't know. Every time Lea Seydoux, who's an actor, a performer that is very good at crying at, across her filmography, but every time she does, especially in this film, it's like. I, I don't know. It's kind of breathtaking and heartbreaking. I don't know. I don't feel what you felt. I do think she's very good, mm -hmm. but it wasn't sending me anywhere. And I'm also a huge fan of Pascal Gregory, who's been acting since the 70s. Um, the dad is excellent. Mm -hmm. I think that actor did a, like an excellent job. Uh, I forget what... I, oh, one of my favorite parts is about him, where he's not really present, is when he has this... 
you know, amazing library in his flat that they have to get rid of. And nobody in the family wants it or has room to get it. But Sandra is very adamant that, you know, we don't just throw these books away. And when she's, and luckily they find this old student of his because he was beloved where he was teaching uh, that basically has room enough to sh sh store these books in a nice order. They categorize them and then say, these are yours to the granddaughter and I, uh, to Lynn. Uh, and I love how Sedu tells her daughter what these books mean and that her father curated them and that he, these books are more him than he is now in this kind of shell of a body. <laughs> but, but to me that felt very moving and I know that you have opposite feelings about those kind of things. Well, but. I think what's interesting is the the point that really, the the part in the movie that really resonated with you about the mom explaining to the daughter that these books are a better portrait of who your grandfather was than seeing him in this nursing home is true. And I think it's interesting that it's like these like effects are his. So the fact that like at a point the family has to decide what to do with them, you know, my personality, it would be very easy to get rid of all the things because they're not mine. Mm -hmm. They do. I understand they have meaning to the person, but, the, but that's not my life. These books are not a portrait of who I am. They just serve as a reminder of the person who I cared and loved for care for and love but um i i thought the better story would have been to focus on that focus on the fact that they have to treat this dad's apartment and all his things as if he has died but he hasn't he's alive he's down the street at some nursing home so maybe like the mother and the daughter going through the books and the daughter the mom explaining to her daughter who her father was through these books and maybe we get little vignettes of memories that the daughter has that were, you know, that she's reminded of. I, I would have preferred that. I didn't need this bland, like, affair. I mean, even, affair is not even, technically it is an extramarital affair. But when I tell you this is the most bland affair you will ever see. Well, and it's interesting because she, her, she's a widow and her dead husband, he, Poupo's character, Clément, was friends with him. And so, but they always had kind of this subdued attraction to one another. But it's very accurate. I, I feel like most people who, you know, engage with people who are not available to them, it reads like this. So it mm -hmm. feels very true to what we actually do, which is like, yeah, I'm seeing some person I know is not single, but I'm going to steal moments and maybe try to convince them half-heartedly to be with me. So it all feels very authentic. Right. It's just that most people's real lives are not that interesting. That's why we have soap operas and like you know, sensational shit because that is more. So that's all I'm saying is that if you want like a dramatic drama, this is not going to do it for you. But I feel the same way I felt about things to come, which is I saw it in San Francisco in a really cute independent theater in a really cute neighborhood and we got coffee before. It was just a nice experience to watch this story. I feel like this movie would be perfect for that as well. Sure. Um, I also like Nicole Garcia, who plays the the mother, and she. I, there's some interesting dynamics there because she's the ex-wife, like many years removed from Georg, right? And yet she has to take on the brunt of, kind of making these arrangements, which she keeps kind of complaining about. And I wanted a little more about Layla, his companion, they keep referring to because. She, she <laughs> looks younger. She's younger than his ex-wife, and yeah. she looks very healthy. But then we're told the reason he can't live with her is because his companion is not in good physical health or her health she is not good. She has health issues, we're told. And it was not clear to me what these issues are because she seems like a spring chicken. It was like, well, why didn't she move into his flat then? But uh, As in, she's probably in her late 50s, but she looks like she's very healthy. Yeah, it's almost like we missed a scene uh, of something explaining what her deal is and why she can't help more uh, if you're so in love with this man. Uh, but yeah, I, I really like this film. I think... Mia Hansen Love is a masterful filmmaker. You know, she used to be, I think, believe partnered with Olivia Asaya. So she shared a lot of uh, those connections with him, like the cinematographer Denis Lenoir, who shot Things to Come, as well as my favorite Asaya's film, uh, Demon Lover, which I still need to make you watch, which is probably controversial com for those who love his work. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just you, for the most part, I didn't love 2018's Maya, but... Everything by Mia Hansen Love is, she's just an excellent filmmaker at making something that's mundane or banal, kind of full of life to me. What would you give it? Four out of five. 
I would give it three and a half out of five. I thought it was very good. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.